Have you ever created the village you wished you had? My guest, Caitlin, said she has been as impacted by the support she didn't get as by the support she did have. And I think so many of us can relate to that. From walking into her first pediatrician's office, having not eaten or had anything to drink, with one boob hanging out and hearing just what she needed to hear at that time, to dealing with an undiagnosed, very rare disorder, which ultimately led to weaning her third child before she would have liked, Caitlin understood the importance of support. And what she is doing as a result will excite you. Whether you are a fellow lactation professional, a birth worker, or a parent who wants others to feel more supported than you did. I hope you enjoy this beautiful story of three totally different baby feeding experiences. When I began breastfeeding, I was blindsided by how difficult it was. I may have thought I was prepared, but having known only a handful of people who had ever breastfed and only seeing it up close from a couple of them, I had a huge learning curve. Since then, I've become a doula, a lactation consultant, and a childbirth educator. I'm your host, Lo Nigrosh, and I welcome you to the Milk Making Minutes, where we explore breastfeeding experiences through the lens of systemic barriers, so that you know your breastfeeding struggles are not your fault, and your triumphs really are the miracles you feel they are. Hi, Caitlin. Welcome to the Milk Making Minutes. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you so much for having me. It is such a pleasure to be here and be able to share my story. Yes. So why don't you start out by introducing yourself and your family? Absolutely. I'm Caitlin McGrath. I am a mother of three. My babies are now a little bit grown up. They're six, eight, and 10. And I nursed all three of them. I'm so excited to share that with you all. I also am a doula. I've been a doula since after my VBAC, my second baby. And I also run Be Her Village, which is a gift registry for parents to get gifts of support for their baby showers so that they can reach their birth, pregnancy, infant feeding, and postpartum goals through their gift registry. Yeah, so important. I know I was just talking with somebody else, a different guest about how we always want to figure out what is the best stroller? What's the best car seat? What toys should I get? And none of that really matters. They all end up playing with the boxes and yeah, there's you know, been like, the stroller doesn't really matter in the end. It really doesn't in the end. And yeah. part of it is, yes, we're going to need some strollers. We're going to need some stuff for our kids. But absolutely nobody in the retail space is talking to parents about the support they need. And that's what I'm doing. I'm introducing this idea. Maybe we should, as birth workers, be talking to parents about, yes, you need some things. But also, if you want to have a successful breastfeeding relationship, for example, you need to line up your support. If you want to have a certain kind of a birth or, quite frankly, a respected (laughs) autonomous birth experience, you're going to need to line up support in the American healthcare system. You're going to need that postpartum care in home. Everybody needs it. It's actually something that almost every other mother in the developed world gets automatically and we don't. And so we're trying to flip that switch and introduce that as moms are making their gift registries because There's this thing where 2% of moms are having home births, 6% of moms are using doulas, 12% are using midwives, but 75% of new moms are making gift registries. So that's where I feel like we need to start that conversation about support and bring our entire profession and the support that we provide into that mainstream conversation. Yeah, I love that. And I'm, I can't wait to hear more about Be Her Village. But I know that you came to this through your own personal experiences. And we are going to look at that through the lens of baby fee. So I'm going to take you way back to when you were a child. And I want you to think about what exposure you had to feeding babies from the body before, before it was your turn. Go way, way back and tell me about that. Yeah, so my first understanding of breastfeeding was that I was breastfed. I was always told that story. Funnily enough, I was told first that my I was breastfed for two years by my mother. And she breastfed me and was like adamant about breastfeeding me because she weaned my older brother, her first baby, after two weeks of nursing him. 
And she always loves to say, and I never really understood this until I had a baby myself. I was, she said, I was completely exhausted and I thought it was from breastfeeding and weaned him. And then I realized, nope, I'm exhausted because I have a newborn. (laughs) Had nothing to do with breastfeeding at all. So she was pretty adamant about breastfeeding me for a lot longer and she breastfed me for two full years. So that was my first sort of story. It was part of my understanding of how I was fed, which was pretty great. But in terms of exposure beyond that my aunt her my mother's sister had her babies a few years after so I was like between five and ten years old when she had little nurslings and when I was in her house and spending time with her it was completely normal I have an actual very vivid memory of her in her living room with the babies on the floor and kind of around and her sitting in the recliner the comfy chair in the corner with her nursing bra flapped down and nursing the baby and it was very normal so that was my understanding that my mom and her sister and essentially like the matriarchs in my family fed their babies with their bodies and it was not a big deal at all so I always had a plan for myself to feed my children in the same way Amazing. Yeah. Your mom's story reminds me of the studies that come out that say on average people feeding their babies from their bodies do get, I think it's like 45 more minutes of sleep a night or something. It's not a huge amount, but the other interesting thing is that the perceptions of how much sleep they get vary widely. So people who feed babies from their bodies underestimate how much sleep they actually get compared to when they measure sleep. And then people who feed formula overestimate the amount of sleep they get. And often it gets the amount of sleep someone gets attributed to the feeding method, when in reality, that's not what the scientific data shows. Yeah, absolutely. So that that was absolutely her story. And again, I did not understand it until I had my own baby. And I was like, yeah. oh, no, I get it. I get it. Newborns are exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Like how you feed. They're just very needy creatures and it's exhausting to care for one, which is why we need support while we're doing it. And breastfeeding and body feeding support is one of those ways that we need. Exactly. Support. Yeah. yeah. And I want to say that if I always support families to do what they want. So if they think taking body feeding out of the equation at night is going to be what helps them, then absolutely do that. Yeah. We have to understand it's not a baby in a standalone way. It's a dyad. And that's whether you're feeding from your body or not, it's a dyad. A baby's health and wellness is completely reliant on the health and wellness of their caregiver. And so if you want to meet your baby's needs, then you have to meet your own needs. And that's just something I wish people had told me earlier. <laughs> that's why I say yeah. it here because because that's not a lesson I learned until I learned it the hard way is to really take care of myself. And I'm quite frankly, I'm still trying to find that balance. I have three kids and now they're they've all got their own lives and things, but it it's something that you sort of just there's not a right time to do it. You just have to do it in imperfect ways the entire time that you're transitioning and that you are a parent. Hard. I know. Yeah. 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 So with that being said, you've given us this introduction into knowing that breastfeeding was what you wanted to do. And so then as you were preparing to have your children, was there any preparation that you did when it came specifically to baby feeding? That's a great question. I got a breast pump. I definitely researched breast pumps. One of the most critical things that actually ended up being one of the pivotal points that led me to successful breastfeeding was researching and then interviewing and selecting a breastfeeding supportive pediatrician. Uh, That was one of the many tasks I was doing along with painting a mural in my nursery and taking childbirth classes and doing various things. And it ended up in my story being the thing that I very easily, that pediatrician's appointment was a point of pure crisis for me. I would have listened to literally anything he said in that moment. He could have set me on a path where I would be a mom sitting here, never having had a successful breastfeeding relationship, let alone breastfeeding three children across two different pregnancies, tandem feeding over the course of five years. So I'm just, if there's one supportive thing that I did for myself, it was researching and selecting pediatrician based solely on their literacy and breastfeeding knowledge. Yeah, I want to sit with that for a minute because I talk about this a lot on the Milk Making Minutes that pediatricians 
are not trained on baby feeding. And so the only way that they know about it is if they seek out extra t- training. And so that you should be asking your pediatrician, how do you support families and who do you partner with to give families who want to feed human milk to their babies that extra support or what additional training have you received besides what you got in medical school? So many people select a pediatrician and they ask, are you supportive of breastfeeding? And of course, the pediatrician is not going to say, no, I'm not supportive of breastfeeding because they all know the quote unquote breast is best narrative, which anyone who has listened to this podcast longer than two minutes knows that I don't think that narrative is helpful to supporting people to feed human milk to their babies. But we, pediatricians know the right answer to that question. Yes. So how did you know that this pediatrician was truly going to be supportive if you needed extra support once you had your baby? So I will be totally transparent and say, I think I got lucky. I don't think, okay. I, I, don't think I asked the right questions. But in in reflecting on that, one of the things I did is I asked other people who reached their goals who they recommended. And that was how I found his name. I was living in Queens in New York City. And I asked other people who were breastfeeding. I I specifically looked up Google reviews for breastfeeding friendly doctors. And I tried to crowdsource some names of people who had a track record. So I, I went and interviewed him. I don't even know if I talked about breastfeeding. I just know that I found his name through that, through breastfeeding being the lens with which I was searching for a doctor for us. But yes, I think I also just got lucky, which thank goodness for that. Yeah. And some people might think that's a little short-sighted because breastfeeding only happens for a little, a a short amount of time. But I think it's a good plumb line for how that provider is going to interact with you for the rest of your child's life. I would add to that. I think absolutely yes. Yes. And you can change pediatricians the way you change your shirt. Like it's not, (laughs) I've never said that before, but I like that. It's not when you're OBs and midwives in the middle of pregnancy, you're making these selections, like people won't take you after 36 weeks or there's all these things. It's not like that. You don't like your pediatrician, call a different one. I have gone through so many pediatricians to find the current one that I have. And I even left him because I was like frustrated with an office visit I had experienced another one much closer to my home and then like immediately called them and apologized and I was like, please take me back. But if you're planning on body feeding, breastfeeding, chest feeding, whatever you want to have, if you're planning on feeding your baby human milk of any kind, you have to get a pediatrician that understands the physiological nature of that. And if I could go back in time, I would ask at what point they would recommend formula based on weight loss. And many of us can feel like we put doctors on pedestals, but please stop doing that. They're just people. They're people that are well-trained in in certain areas. And we need to look at them as a purchase and do the research before you make that purchase. And so ask them about what it looks like if your baby loses X percent of their weight, ask them how quickly they would recommend formula, really dig into it. Because that's the same thing I do is have these conversations in the hypothetical, because then you're not in crisis, then they're not feeling like they can't say an alternative because it, you know, they have to have follow a standard of care. You can speak in the hypothetical and the earlier that you do while you're still pregnant or while your baby is still not in your family, then that is better for you. You can go and ask those pointed questions to pediatricians and find out because let me tell you, when you are a few days postpartum and you're not sure which way is up, a person that seems like they know what they're doing and is like rec- making recommendations about the health of your baby, which I feel like if someone told me before, that's like literally the only thing I would care about, I would be like, oh, come on. Like, I would have perspective on this. I would have context. I could do my research. When you're in that moment of the haze of postpartum, and for me, I had a C-section. I was like, I literally, it was like getting hit by a bus. I -hmm. walked into my doctor's office three days postpartum, and he literally looked at his nurse And he goes, go get two cups of water, please. I didn't know what that was for. It was for me because he looked at me. First of all, the hilarious part about this is that I had been trying to nurse. Like nursing was not going well, but I was trying to nurse in the waiting room and like my bra was still out. Like I hadn't pulled down my shirt. I was just, I was an absolute mess. My lips were dry. I was gaunt. I was 
a wreck. And he looked at me and he goes, how's it going? And I go, I don't know. I don't think it's going well. I don't think, I don't think he's gaining weight. I don't think I have milk. I just, I don't think it's going great. And he had already sent the nurse out and he looks at me and he goes, have you been eating or drinking? (laughs) And I remember just feeling like, why would he care if I'm eating or drinking? We're here to talk about the baby. And I was like, I just looked at him like, no, what? No. <laughs> he was like, okay, so to make milk, he didn't say it as patronizing. It was just making it funny. But to make milk, you need to eat and drink. And he looked at my mother and he was like, can you make sure she eats and drinks? And my mom was like nodding with big eyes like, yes, I will make sure. And it was just like, oh, and the nurse came and he was like, sit down, drink some water right now. Like he could just, I can't even imagine quite honestly, like telling the story, which is a thousand percent not over exaggerated. I can't even imagine how awful I looked. I just can't even imagine that he knew to tell his nurse to go get water as soon as I walked in the door. And in that moment, we weighed the baby and the baby was, I'm sure he was over that 10% weight loss benchmark that we say that is fine. And he knew my birth had gone off the rails. I had planned an out of hospital birth center birth and midwife supported. And then I ended up with this induction and possibly, probably an unnecessary C-section, like the standard American medical experience. So fun to be a woman. And then I clung on to breastfeeding working. So I was in this mindset. Some people can be like, oh, my birth, my birth went sideways, whatever. I don't care. I, as soon as my birth went sideways, I didn't care actually about how the birth happened. I was so grateful for the C-section. I couldn't wait for the, the horrible trap in that hospital that I was in. And that's like a completely different story. But I was happy for the C-section because it gave me my baby and it got me out of that experience. But then I became absolutely dead set on making breastfeeding work because something had to work from this experience. Some goal needed to be reached and I wasn't going to lose that too. Oh, I'm getting I'm getting a little choked up about it. But but the all of the vision that I had for my birth was completely out the window. And I wasn't going to let them take breastfeeding from me. It's like such a crazy thing to say, but I wasn't going to let them take that from me. So I really became very determined. And, and I think he saw that in me. And so I asked him, do I need to supplement with formula? And honestly, I think if he, if that wasn't my story, he would have said yes. (laughs) But he said, I'm not going to tell you to supplement with formula. And I'm not going to tell you not to supplement with formula. I'm going to leave it up to you. We're going to ask you to come back in two days. Keep breastfeeding in two days at day five of life. If we're not seeing breast milk come through, like the breast milk poop come through, then it's a different conversation and we'll have it there. But you can do this. Keep going. And it was like, I don't even know if that was breastfeeding supportive, to be honest with you. (laughs) Probably not. But he didn't say, yes, you're failing, which was helpful to, to me. So I went home and I breastfed and there was no breast milk poop. There was no breast milk poop. It was starting to get a little from that black meconium to that green, but it wasn't turning into that beautiful like deli mustardy yellow fatty seedy sort of poop. I love breast milk poop, by the way, if you couldn't tell. And this, it was this like dramatic moment where we went back to the pediatrician and we had not had a breast milk diaper and it was day five. And he says, okay, take his diaper off. We're going to weigh him. And when I took his diaper off, breast milk poop. <laughs> it was like the coolest thing in the whole world. I can't believe how emotional I am about this moment. I'm really reliving it. It was breast milk poop. I did it. Like everything that I poured in, I was like night and day. I was just 24 hours a day. I was nursing this child. I was trying to figure it out in retrospect probably could have used a lactation visit, right? But I like, I honestly didn't even know about this stuff. So I was just fiercely determined. I just kept latching them and latching them and it was hurting and it was cracked and it was bleeding and it was, Mm. it was awful, but I was just not going to quit. And that grit was what got us through to day five and on day five, breast milk poop and he gained weight. It was just, oh my God, it was like, it was the most triumphant it was just the most triumphant moment. And that was what set us, then we were breastfeeding, then we were fine. And it just, I don't have any other story from that entire 20 month experience of breastfeeding him because it was just from that moment on, we had figured it out. That first breast milk diaper was just like 
the most glorious moment in my breastfeeding relationship with him. I love that. And there's so many parts to that story. So many of us can re- relate to the moment when we realized, okay, we're doing it. Yes. Whether it's like the milk squirting out or the first time our shirt got really wet or the first time we see milk coming out of the baby's mouth. I love all of or, those moments. <laughs> yeah, the first milk drunk look on the baby's face. Yeah. Or, yeah, we have been seeing that weight go down on the scale and the first time we put the baby on the scale and it's gone up and you get that that feeling of, okay, we've yeah. turned the corner. It's just, it's triumphant. And I think that story looks different for everybody. And that was my, it was breast milk poop. It's, and part of it, like what you're saying is part of the struggle with breastfeeding is that you can't see it go in. You have to trust. There's like this faith that you have to have in yourself. And again, like that's not something most little girls are programmed to have is trust and faith and reliance on our bodies. And and it was really cool to see that come through. And I remember also the first time I pumped, it was like, oh my gosh, look at this. I just couldn't believe I was making milk. It was evidence of what I had already had proof of through the poop and weight gain and all of that. Hi, I'm Kanika, and you're listening to That's Total Mom Sense, the podcast, where I interview public figures on their life lessons in parenting, legacy, and built-in sixth sense. Hey, what's up? I'm Kelly Rowland, and you're checking out That's Total Mom Sense. Hi, this is Chelsea Clinton, and my experience on That's Total Mom Sense was fantastic. It's me, Bobby Brown. Can't wait to share my story. Thank you to my guests, brand partners, community, and you for making this show possible. Episodes release every Thursday wherever you listen to podcasts. You can join my tribe by logging on to thatstotalmomsense.com and by following me on YouTube, TikTok, and Instagram at Kanika Chadda Gupta. Now let's dive in to today's episode. Yeah, I love that. And I we can always look back on a story and say, oh yeah, this person could have been more supportive in X, Y, and Z way. But what I love about the story that you just that that you just shared about the pediatrician was that he was not making you feel incapable, which is what happens so often when a person feeding a baby from their own body comes into the pediatrician's office and they hyper fixate on weight. And he was also looking at poops, which is good. He was looking at two data points. But he also was keeping in mind the birth experience you had, which it sounds like it was a multi-day affair that ended in a C-section. We know that first weight can be elevated as a result. We know that milk can delay as a result. And so he's keeping that in mind. So he's keeping a few data points in mind. He's saying he wants to keep a close eye on the baby, asking you to come in a couple of days. He could have said, hey, I know this great lactation consultant. Would you like her to come to your house? But he did not plant a seed of doubt that you were incapable. Yeah. Oh, quite the opposite. It was actually the thing that he left me with was you have to take care of yourself if you expect to take care of your baby, which actually is a lesson I have learned over and over again, right? That was, he looked, he took one look at me and I don't think he was surprised my baby was not getting milk because how could a person in the state that I was in, whatever state that was, how with a he boob just, hanging out, with a boob <laughs> hanging out and dry lips and just looking for him, for his first question to be, have you eaten or drank anything since you gave birth? That's quite a question. What did I look like? And the truth was I hadn't because I was hyper fixated on making breastfeeding work. I also had perhaps a touch of undiagnosed postpartum anxiety, but just a thought. And so it's all he saw. And I think what really came into play here was his expertise. He had been around breastfeeding people before and he knew how to support them. And he was, I think he was a little nervous about my baby 
according to the weight be- because of how he made that sort of, I'm not going to tell you one way or the other. That wasn't saying, hey, your baby's fine. Your milk will come in. It was, we're not sure, but let's keep a close eye on it. And I had his trust and I had direct instructions to go home and eat and drink for myself. And it did the trick. Whether you are pregnant and beginning the process of choosing a pediatrician and would like some prenatal education about lactation or have already had your first pediatrician visit, if you would like an IBCLC by your side who can help you navigate human milk feeding in the way that works best for you, your baby, and your family's unique set of circumstances, I would love to be the person who listens fully who reduces your anxiety instead of increasing it, and who helps you feel more confident about feeding your baby. Reach out to me at quabinbirthservices.com for more information. Many of these appointments can be done virtually, and depending on your insurance, many of them can be at no cost to you. Can't wait to hear from you. So I love hearing this story of this pediatrician who wasn't sounding all the alarms right yeah. away. And that first question that he asked is really so beautiful and shows that he was seeing you as a human being who needed support and not just the person bringing in a baby who needed to be protected from their crazy mother who wanted to breastfeed at all costs. Yes. Okay, so you mentioned that you fed your first baby for about 20 months. Yes. You also mentioned you tandem fed. Was that with this? That was baby with this or? one. So I got okay. pregnant. I'm trying to think. I got pregnant. I gave birth. They were 23 months apart. And I okay. nursed him, I guess, till about six months into my second pregnancy. I had no feelings about weaning him. Like I was fine to wean him. I was fine to tandem it and it just naturally I don't know I actually have very little memory of that weaning because it was very organic it was just like it was there for him it was offered he baby stopped requesting and quite frankly the milk dried up and it became uncomfortable for me and I think it was like what am I doing here for him (laughs) which is actually very much his personality now if I'm not getting something out of this what am I doing so yeah it was a very low pressure situation as far as his weaning goes and my second baby I feel like I have to talk about the birth in in the context of this feeding relationship his birth was a triumphant life transforming unmedicated VBAC, which is vaginal birth after cesarean. I'm pretty sure anyone listening to this knows that. It was incredible. And he came out alert. I don't even know if I had an IV, but if I did, I was in the hospital for 43 minutes (laughs) before he came out. He was placed on my chest. Oh, and it was just, he was just looking around and he was so clear eyed. He was just alert and present and we were alert and present with him and it was this beautiful moment of just getting to know him it was just this beautiful joining of us and getting to meet him for the first time and about 15 minutes after that I slid him down to my left breast and the staff was like do you need any help and I'm like no he's latched he's good he's latched I just knew what to do and because his birth had been uninhibited and not interrupted the physiological process as much as it could be in a hospital. He just sat there and he latched on and he, it was beautiful and he nursed for 45 minutes. And I don't remember any weight gain issues. He was just, he was the perfect baby. It was the perfect birth. The breastfeeding relationship was so great. He was so different too. I went and became a doula five months after that VBAC because I was just called into how do we make, how do we make more of the second experience and less of the first, right? And, and I remember that my first one, my baby, my two-year-old, two and a half year old at the time, still struggled with being away from me. He struggled with me going to births. And my six month old was just so perfectly happy. I would go to I would go to work for a few hours to like a prenatal visit and he would I would come back and he would nurse for 15 minutes flat and then just go about his way and he was just this really easygoing baby and it all just felt very good and that was just such a relief especially after my first. It did create that entire birth experience and breastfeeding experience did create this like false sense of oh this baby is easy and this birth was easy and this breastfeeding relationship is easy because I'm such a good mom 
Like, I totally nailed this, and it's obviously all because of me. And just foreshadowing, that was not the case. I went, I was tricked, I was tricked into having a third baby. (laughs) And then I was shown just how wrong I was. Oh, my goodness. Um, I had my triumphant birth and triumphant baby feeding experience and decided to take my win. Quit quit while you're ahead. ahead. (laughs) Yeah, I did not do that. God. Like really. And then I got my daughter. Oh my Lord. Oh my Lord. Yeah. So my daughter's breastfeeding relationship was overshadowed by her struggle with what we eventually diagnosed. And by we, I mean me and the interwebs, which is part of what just, I have a little bit of a chip on my shoulder about the medical system, because if you are not fitting into a box you're not getting a diagnosis unless you do research and you empower yourself with information and knowledge. So she was, she only came to be because I did not have a repeat C-section. I was like perfectly happy to have two little boys. And while I was preparing for my VBAC, I was trying to, I lined myself up again with selecting a very known track record VBAC supportive OBGYN. And I just was like to my husband, I said, listen, if I end up with another C-section, I'm done. And that's not a judgment on anybody else. I just knew I was not going to put myself on the line for a third surgery, especially in the third like surgery in the same site. There's just something about that makes my skin crawl about that idea for myself. And so I knew that the door to a third baby was only open if I had a vaginal birth for my second. And I did. So the, here we are. <laughs> And she was a planned home birth. And I'm a big believer that babies, their pregnancies and births match their personalities. I think it's just really like my first one, a little oppositional in his birth and his personality. (laughs) My second one, easy, easy, beautiful dream birth, dream baby. Third one, it was like getting hit by a bus in my living room. She was, and it still is to just be in her presence. She is a force to be reckoned with. And despite her being my third, there was nothing easy about her. So our girls... Our girls today need to be forces to be reckoned with. Oh so I more thought, power to more her. More power to them. I had this mis- misconception that as that I would raise a girl and I would insert my understanding of power into her. Oh no. I get a <laughs> lesson. You. <laughs> I get a lesson on how to be fully confident, how to stand your ground, how to create from this authentic place daily from her. She is my absolute my biggest teacher. Um, Me too. My daughter too. <laughs> oh my goodness. When I was preparing for my home birth though, I would watch videos. I would watch videos for myself and I would also watch videos with my boys because I wasn't sure if they were going to be there in the room. And I, I was open to either way. They didn't end up being there because I labor best. I go into labor when I'm not near my children. And if you go and watch any home birth video online, it's a peaceful mama in the water. You can't even tell it's a birth and the baby comes out. There's all these like gorgeous. Okay. So I was screaming and Annabelle in her like beautiful home birth comes out of the water, absolutely screaming her head off. Like, this is, this was our birth story. It was fast. That was part of it. Like my VBAC, my na- my natural, quote unquote natural, my vaginal birth was 21 hours of like slow, easy, not easy, but like slow learning, but it's not that active labor. And then it got like really intense in the nighttime. And then he was born about five or six hours after it got intense. So for Annabelle, I was really expecting it in a totally illogical way. As a doula, I know you should not expect it to be the same for your second vaginal birth, but somehow, and I bet the birth professionals that are listening can understand this, absolutely no self-reflection as my professional self. I just expected it to be the same. I just expected it to be the same. And it was not. So I woke up at the same time on the same day of the week. Like it was a weekend birth for my second And I woke up in the morning, like with little contractions. And then it lasted all day and into the evening. And he was born at 3 a.m. the next day. With her, I woke up at the same time and I gave birth before noon. (laughs) So I was like, I went from super calm to, it was under six hours, the whole labor. And it was fierce. It was just, it really, it caught me off guard. People like to say to me like, oh, I hope I have a short labor. I'm like, listen, 
there's something to be said about those longer labors. It gives you time to catch up emotionally and mentally with the transition into the next phase. And when it goes fast, you're getting the same amount of intensity in a shorter amount of time and you cannot even catch your breath to realize what's happening. So that's that's our story. I also experienced fetal ejection reflex with her. Of course I did because it's Annabelle. Where essentially I was like, in the water, I had gotten into the water. I knew I was getting closer to pushing. And then I suddenly was just my body was pushing her. I was not pushing her. And I ended up as I was birthing her, pulling back, like trying to hold her back as my uterus was pushing her out. It was a really interesting dynamic. And then I expected fully for our breastfeeding relationship to be perfect. Why wouldn't it be? I had already breastfed two babies. I had also, with my second, I had breastfed throughout the whole pregnancy with my third and he was still nursing which by the way a note on tandem feeding (laughs) I thought I was so looking forward to tandem feeding I absolutely hated it it was like having this tiny little sweet seven pound newborn and then having a nine-year-old child come and attack your boob it's just your older toddler who like feels little before you have a newborn once you introduce a newborn it's like having a, almost a full-grown adult, like just attack you and try to get breast milk. It was uncomfortable. I really didn't enjoy it. I know people do. It just wasn't for me. Interestingly enough, his weaning story also really not, it was not stressful or traumatic. He actually just stopped asking. I think, I don't think he enjoyed it all that much, like having her nearby. I'm wondering if maybe the milk tasted different. And I think he could probably sense my hesitation and my tension when he was doing it. And so he just, he was two years old and he was like, Oh, he wasn't even two. He was 21 months when she was born. So he was 22 months and it was just kind of like, no milkies. Like he literally would just say, no milkies. Okay, cool. And we were done. So I had this third baby and she was vomiting. It started with a little spit up. It started with spit up on like day two, a little spit up on day three. And then her poop wasn't coming. So like how the poop was like our triumphant moment for baby number one her poop was not coming. And it was, even the meconium wasn't coming. Like we had a few meconium poops and then there was just nothing. And I looked at her, I felt like she was getting skinnier. And I just had this maternal instinct of something's wrong here. I don't know what's wrong, but I know something is wrong here. And it turns out that she has something called f which is food protein induced enterocolitis syndrome, which is one of those things that While I was trying to figure her out over the course of two years where I was going to pediatricians, she was getting diagnosed with reflux. She ended up at the ER 11 days post beautiful home birth. We're sitting in a germ filled ER trying to get her an IV because she was just limp and lethargic and not well and losing weight and losing weight at an alarming rate. It was one of those conditions that I like I would look up as I was getting her diagnosed with reflux and it would pop up and it was like, no, there's no way that could be because it is really rare. So I want to sort of preface this with this is a rare thing, but it turns out in the end that it's a a gastro allergy to corn, dairy, gluten, and tomatoes. So like essentially a slice of pizza, which I love pizza. And Her corn sensitivity, I think, is the thing that is the reason why it took two years to figure her out because her corn sensitivity, we don't really eat a lot of corn as a family, but she would react when there was any corn based anything in her food, which if you've ever watched like the documentaries on our food supply, corn is in everything because it's subsidized by our federal government. So they put it in everything. Part of what was difficult is she would react two hours after she ate something. So she would have a bite of an apple with the skin on. Cool. That's not corn. Except the wax that they put on the apple is corn based. So that would trigger her. We went once to wineries like in the wine region on Long Island and She had been healed. We had cleared her diet. I had weaned her at this point. And she drank water out of this plastic cup. Who would think that this would trigger her FIs? I flipped the cup up after she drank it and got sick from it. And it's made from corn-based plastic. And it's, oh my goodness, it's just following us everywhere. So it took me two years after putting her on all kinds of Prilosec and these inhibitors for her acid and... She was just like on this high dose of medication. I was compounding it at home because the doctors like wouldn't give me more of it and she needed 
more of it. So I just compound. What were you compounding at home? Prilosec. I, I would buy Prilosec and I would compound it with water and Tums. There, I, there was like a formula in this group that I had joined, which is not something, by the way, I'm like professionally recommending anyone do. It's just that was like, I was in survival mode. I was trying yeah. to keep my kid healthy and I wasn't being supported mm-hmm. by any of the professionals I was bringing her to. And so I was successfully breastfeeding her in the sense that I was getting milk into her. But when you just said earlier that you left your $1,200 scale in someone's house, I just had this memory that I have not thought about in years because she's been healed from this since her third birthday and she's about to have her fourth. So it's been four years of f free. Thank God it's this condition that they grow out of. If you are like me and are always looking to know more about anything that could impact human milk feeding, I have linked one study about f and breastfed babies. It is very rare, or at least rarely diagnosed, and is something I would like to see studied more. That study is linked in the show notes. But she was losing weight so rapidly, I made it my full-time job. I actually kind of went back to like how I was with my first, just feeding and feeding, but I was obsessively feeding and weighing. I would know if she peed, she would lose an ounce. I knew if she threw up, she would lose three ounces. We had to go nurse again. It was just this constant cycle of trying to keep her fed while also trying to figure out what the problem was. And the problem, quite frankly, was everything she was eating and everything I was eating. And it's frustrating because if you go to the official literature, it says that like none of those proteins can pass through breast milk, but you know what? They do. They just do. And they do. And they would affect her if I ate those foods. So around her second birthday, I finally clicked into place that this is what she has. And I knew I needed to get her healthy. And there could have been better ways to do it. But I remember I just nursed her this last time. I was changing her diet completely. I was taking out all of these offensive foods. And like, I figured out what those foods were by essentially clearing her diet, cooking every single thing for her, and then adding things back in. So that's how we figured out about those four main allergens. And I laid her down. I'm probably going to cry again. I laid her down for her nap. And I just, I breastfed her for her nap. And that was it. That was the last time. (laughs) Mm. That was the last time I've ever breastfed, actually. And I did it because once I figured out what was wrong, I needed to take action immediately because she had been sick for so long. It was almost like a sacrifice I had to make. I couldn't make the weaning experience about me or like that was not how I wanted to end five years of breastfeeding, but I needed to get her healthy because it had been such a long struggle. And I remember two moments. (laughs) I remember crying in my kitchen to my husband, similar to this of just being like, my, my breasts are so full of milk and I want to give it to her and I can't. And it was really difficult. And then, funnily enough, it was like this impatience for my body to stop producing milk for her. Yeah. And then it stopped. And then I was just like, oh, there was just this whole new emptiness of I've had milk in my body for five years now. And now I don't have any more. And it was just, oh, it was really painful. And especially, it's funny that I can't even remember the weaning process for my sons. Like, I don't even, it was just really nondescript. They did it on their own terms. And I think this one felt a little stolen from us because it wasn't on my terms and it wasn't on her terms. And it was the right decision. And I actually had this really interesting, like, as soon as I did it, paired with that grief was I finally had a healthy baby. She was Mm -hmm. her, she got pudgy. She was eating everything. She wasn't sick. We didn't have her on meds. She got her appetite back. She she just came back to us and it was worth it. It was absolutely worth Mm -hmm. it. And actually I started to feel a tinge of regret. I felt regretful for being so adamant about breastfeeding her that I kept breastfeeding. I don't know. There's no right way. This is hard. Parenting is hard. (laughs) This is the conclusion I'm reaching here. It is hard no matter how you do it. And you just try to make the best decision for yourself and your kids at every point of the way. And it's going to be imperfect. And you're going to have imperfect information. And you're going to have regret whether you do it or you don't do it. And that's okay. And that's our story. And I'm really proud of what I did. And funnily enough, like even though our weaning story was 
pretty painful. She was the one I breastfed the longest. I had the longest nursing relationship with her. You shared the, that those really visceral experiences of realizing, okay, this is it. I have all this milk and it's not going to be used for anybody, which I know so many people will relate to that because even if people are ready to wean, the actual doing it can be hard to know that the milk is going away. Yeah. And so knowing that you had these three very, really vastly different baby feeding experiences and three very different birth experiences too. And you became a birth doula after that second experience. Tell us how all of this manifested into be her village? Yeah, that's a great question. My experiences that I just shared are really the way on this path to to help mothers because I felt so impacted by the support I had and I felt equally as impacted by the support I didn't have. And I really wanted to make sure that every single person who chooses to become a mother or chooses to become a parent or chooses to welcome a baby into their family has the support that I received and that I desperately needed and didn't receive. And what it comes down to for me is that finances are often the barrier to people getting care. And that's a really awful reason to not be able to get the support you need. It, The way our system is currently set up, you have to pay thousands of dollars out of pocket for doula care, hundreds of dollars for lactation care, hundreds or thousands of dollars for in-home postpartum care. Like we, you have to have disposable money, disposable income in order to get basic care. And that is not okay with me. And one of the things that stands out for me was just that I was after my first birth while I was trying to figure out breastfeeding. And actually, it's funny, I always tell the story of Be Her Village. And I tell it where I was trying to get ready for the first pediatrician's appointment, which is the one I just shared with all of you. I never go further into that story. I'm so glad I had the opportunity to. But I remember like I was struggling a little bit as my doctor saw. And I remember my mom was coming to pick me up and I was home alone. My husband was back at work. He had no paid parental leave. We couldn't afford unpaid leave. I had no care. And I was three days postpartum, post C-section. And I was trying to figure out how to feed this baby who wasn't latching well and that wasn't going well, how to take a shower. And my mom walked in and I was crying in the recliner in my nursery And I just remember like that moment is so crystallized in my brain because I was in my nursery and that is where I was surrounded by all the gifts that people gave me. That was the way my village had supported me. And God, people want to support new moms. There is such a deep desire to support new moms. But how are we told to do it? We're told to go to their baby shower and buy them stuff off their baby registry. And what's on their baby registry? A bunch of expensive baby stuff they're either going to return, not use, or it's not really going to help them in those moments. And the retail stores and the traditional baby registries are not talking to moms and parents about what they actually need because what they need is support. They need communities of friends, families, neighbors, and professionals to care for them. And so knowing nothing, (laughs) truly nothing except my own lived experience as a mother and as a doula, I set out, I hired a developer and I created the baby registry I needed. And it's awesome, quite frankly. It's You can go and you can add your doulas. You can find support in your local area if you don't have it. And I would invite every birth worker that's listening, it's free. Go to beherevillage.com, create a profile, add your services. Like We have parents looking for their support. And more importantly, we have people getting funded. So their friends and family are sending them $50 towards their doula or $100 towards their lactation care, or they're paying their entire midwife fee for them. And we've had $131,000 as of today funded on our site. Over a thousand gifts have been given. And this is a really small business that is a big idea. And we're just, we're working together. We're not funded. We don't pay for marketing. We're literally just telling our story. I'm telling my story. And we're trying to change the way that people can access this care. I've cried like four times today. Like if the care is impactful and I gave birth 10 years ago and I'm still crying as if it was yesterday. It's impactful. The way you feel when you become a parent, the way you feel when you give birth, the way you feel when you reach or don't reach your feeding goals impacts you. It's an emotional experience and we deserve care and we deserve better gifts that are 
giving us that care. It's such a no brainer. And I don't know why I'm the first one to have done it. And I'm just really glad that I have the big vision that we have for Be Her Village. And it's why I invite the birth workers to come and check out our platform and share it with your clients is that what we want to do is we want to offer these big box retailers a way to access our care. We want to bring our sort of hyper local community care to the big box stores so that we can reach those 75% of moms that are making registries and not even aware of what doulas are, not even thinking about lactation care. And I was one of them. You heard my story. Why did I not have a lactation consultant? If my doctor had told me it, if it was on my registry list, like I probably would have considered it, but it wasn't even on my radar. And quite frankly, even if it was, I don't know in those moments of crisis where I was barely eating and drinking, if I could have found one, sourced one and paid for it. So we're trying to overcome those obstacles for parents where you can set up that support team while you're planning your baby shower. You can set up your support team while you're 20 weeks pregnant and have everybody's information and get the funds to pay for them. And then it's just a matter of clicking a button when you need their support rather than starting from scratch when you're already in crisis. So that's what we're working on. And I just really invite everybody. This is, it is something that's growing. There's a lot of excitement about it. Amazing. Yeah, I'm registered, although I need to check my registry and make sure it's up to date. So I'll do that. Is there a way for people to check to see whether their insurance covers the service first before people start putting their money into something that those damn insurance providers should be covering already? That's a great question. So on every, um, there's listing, there is payment details and they, sometimes they'll say that they're covered or they're not, but every single profile too for businesses has a messaging feature. So you can just message directly and say, Hey, this is my insurance. Curious about what you cover. There's a way to be in touch. Part of what I want to do is make it easier. If you try to shop for the support you need, it's really hard. It's hard to know who to reach out to. And then like, it's hard to find everybody's individual websites and send emails and who's not active. It's more difficult than it should be. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing your personal stories. All three of them are so impactful. And I love how those stories led you to such a big mission that is making and will make big impact. And I'm looking forward to seeing what that does and how we can continue to partner together to make change. It has been really an honor. It feels so good. I feel a little bit lighter. I didn't even realize I needed to tell these stories. I tell my birth stories a lot, but I don't know that I've told my breastfeeding stories. So thank you for the opportunity. This podcast is really important and I'm grateful for you and I'm grateful for your support and your being part of Be Her Village. This is how we're doing it. This is how we're making the change for the next parent. So thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. It's my pleasure to hold the space. My conversation with Caitlin demonstrates that our experiences of human milk feeding impact us long after we are done with this time of our lives, which is why it is so important that people at this time of their lives get treated with the care, honesty, and respect they deserve. I'm so thankful for so many of my colleagues who have made it their mission to improve the care of lactating people. And I am so thankful for people like Caitlin, who establish creative solutions to systemic problems. And just so you know, birth workers and lactation professionals and postpartum support professionals, you can register to be on her site for free, but there is also a paid membership level and she has provided a code just for my listeners. So you can use the code milkmaking25 to save 25% off any annual plan and or a gift registry expert certification course. So you can go to her site to create either just your totally free birth worker registry site like I have already done, or you can use that code if you want to contribute to more solutions to systemic barriers. Join my Milk Making Minutes community group on Facebook. And one more ask, share this episode with a birth worker who would be interested in Be Her Village. Thanks. Bye. Hi, Julie. Hi. 
So if you had a baby and you took your baby to the pediatrician and they told you something that was wrong or that didn't really feel right to you about feeding your baby, what would you do? I would say that isn't really he he feeling good to me. That doesn't really feel good. Oh, so you would just say that doesn't feel good to me. Yes. Yeah. Would you keep that same doctor or would you find a different one? I would keep it and say, go please. He's not say those things. I think that's great. Great. Thanks. Bye. Bye.